Hey, this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and this year the U.S. is set to hit 7,000 breweries open and operating across the country. And although growth has slowed, it's hard to look back over the past decade and not see a crazy explosion in the craft beer scene here in the United States. And not only has the industry grown like crazy since 2008, but looking back, things have changed quite a bit. Once small breweries have grown big and acquisitions by big corporations like AB InBev have changed the craft beer landscape almost completely. So let's turn back the clock on the beer world by 10 years and look at the big stories in craft beer from 2008. After reading all these stories, it's a surprise how far the industry has come and how much has changed. Leave a like down below for quality beer content and let's get started. I'm going to start with a nice wide angle view of the craft beer scene in 2008. So let's go to one of the best groups for beer stats on the internet, the Brewers Association. In 2008, the US finished the year with 1,574 breweries and this was seen as a big growth year for craft beer because the industry added 63 new breweries. And already this first number and the attitude about it just shows one of the big differences up front. If in 2018 the US only gained 63 new breweries, there would be endless articles about how craft beer is over and everyone needs to jump ship out of the industry. From 2016 to 2017, there was a net brewery gain of nearly 900 breweries, ending that year with almost 6,400 breweries. The crazy growth rate in the past year has been 15 times that of 2008, and yet they were celebrating a crazy year of growth back then. And beyond just the sheer number of breweries being very different, the market itself was quite different too. Craft beer market share was just 4% of beer industry volume in the United States. In 2017, it was 6 times that at 24%. Grocery stores didn't really have any craft beer. Tap rooms and craft beer bars were an uncommon sight and only in the hippest of neighborhoods in big cities. Getting to a brewery was much harder and distributors were only starting to recognize the value of carrying a lot of different craft beers. In addition, the beers people were brewing and drinking were pretty dang different 10 years ago. I took a look at Rate Beer's top 100 beers from 2008 and 2017 and there were some surprising differences. I know Rate Beer has some issues and definitely has a bias towards stouts but the differences in the top 10 beers are a little bit shocking. Looking at 2008, we see the top 10 list is very, very dark. Seven Imperial Stouts, a Quad, a Barley Line, and a Belgian Strong Ale. Drinkers were turning to craft beers for big ABVs, big flavors, and perhaps most importantly, big reputations. What a better way to differentiate yourself from corporate light lagers than by brewing the biggest, baddest stout you can cook up. Ten years later, can you guess what tops Rate Beer's list? I'll give you a couple seconds. If you guessed a couple of hazy tropical IPAs, you'd be right. Actually, now there are two hazy IPAs and a double IPA to go along with the Rate Beer typical barley wines and imperial stouts. But this switch is a big deal. In 2008, there were no fruit forward beers or super hoppy IPAs in the top 10 of drinkers favorites. I went through the whole 2008 list and it takes till number 14 to find an IPA, number 17 before you get anything with fruit in it, and to find a sour, which is fairly popular in 2018, you have to go to all the way to number 38. So even the stout and barley wine focused bros at Rate Beer have come around to the hazy fruity world of American craft beer in 2018. Interestingly, although they don't give data on this anymore, Rate Beer actually gives the number of ratings for these top beers in 2008. These numbers show another trend for consumers, the rise of rating beer online. Look at the top 10 beers from 2008 again. The most rated beer is number 7, the Bell's Expedition Stout, with just 239 ratings throughout that entire year. I know a hyper-local hole-in-the-wall breweries that get way more untapped check-ins than that nowadays. It's crazy how now that everyone has a smartphone, everyone can now be a beer critic. Follow me on Untapped below, by the way, for some bad and rather optimistic beer reviews. On the brewer's side too, it's easy to see that the beers they've been brewing have changed too. 
It's tough to find a brewery that had their beer release schedule dating back to 2008, but Dogfish Head was kind enough to oblige my beer nerd obsessions. Looking at what they were brewing, I see their signature IPAs, a couple fruity seasonal beers, not sours mind you, a pumpkin ale, and two seasonal stouts. This seems like a fairly standard offering for the time. IPAs and stouts were king. Keep a couple lighter fruitier offerings for those who aren't into mega hops or ABVs. Fast forward to 2018, and we see Dogfish Head is brewing the same IPAs and stouts, but have added a plethora of fruit beers. Up to six or seven fruity releases a year, and quite a few of those are sours. The pumpkin ales and fruit aged beers have been buried amongst all these different lighter beers with fruity additions. And that's to say nothing about the haze craze. Check out last week's video for my rant on that. Finally, before we take a trip back to the present, let's go through the major beer industry news stories from 2008. Ray Daniels began offering the first tests in the Cicerone program, a beer industry training program similar to the several that exist in the wine industry. It seems this first exam was a little bit easier than the one today, as one of the questions was, draft beer lines should be cleaned every 14 days. True or false? The consolidation of beer distributors was a big concern for craft brewers. The usually unseen leg of the three-tiered distribution system here in the US is pretty dang important, and the idea of consolidation as a tool to suppress craft beer was all too common in articles. Joe Lipa, a beer importer, predicted that in three to five years, the new mega distributors will move to only one or two national craft brands and a couple local and regional brands. Thank goodness Mr. Lipa was wrong. There was also much worry in 2007 that the price of hops would make a major jump in 2008 as US producers were concerned about a down year. Fortunately, Germany was there to pick up the slack with a great bumper crop, and more farmers than expected were growing crops commercially in the US. This trend would definitely continue over the next decade. The movement towards craft beer in cans officially began. New Belgium began releasing its flagship fat tire beer in cans in 2008 and some breweries like Buckbean Brewing in Nevada opened by only canning beers. No bottling going on there. And Max Rydell, the CEO of Spielglau, launched a line of high-end beer glasses to begin Oktoberfest in New York City in 2008. Seeing the craft beer trend rising, this would prove to be a great decision for the German company. Looking back to 2008, it's fascinating to see how far craft beer has come. By no means was craft beer unpopular in 2008, but it certainly isn't a huge institution like it is today. I also love seeing how the tastes of brewers and drinkers have evolved. While big stouts and barley wines haven't gone away, they certainly aren't what a lot of people think of when they ponder the craft beer segment. I for one hope the next 10 years bring a lot of good stories about the industry maturing, and I'll be with you along on that ride. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button down below. It really helps ensure great beer content reaches more people. And if you want to stay up to date on beer related news stories over the next 10 years, check the links in the description below and head over to the Beer by the Numbers Facebook page. Lots of great beer discussion happening there. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next week with more well-aged beer content.